Les sables qui chantent chantent tout le temps, pas seulement sur la phase d'avalanche. Et là, on n'est pas sur une phase d'avalanche, on est sur un plateau. La phase d'avalanche est là-bas. Et en fait, dès que le sable est cisaillé, il chante. Par exemple. Mmh. On peut aussi le cisailler comme ça. Et faire différentes notes. La seule différence entre le plateau et la phase d'avalanche, c'est que sur le plateau, si je pousse le sable, dès que je m'arrête, il s'arrête. Alors que sur la phase d'avalanche, il continue à couler en avalanche. Il est cisaillé par la gravité, et du coup, il fait toujours la même note. Et c'est ça le chant des dunes. On the western coast of Africa lies a region listed on most maps only as Western Sahara. Home to the indigenous Sahrawi people, many of whom have lived under imposed Moroccan rule or as exiles from refugee camps in Algeria since 1975. Sahrawi autonomy has been under constant attack for centuries, and recent protests for the right to self-determination have been met with harsh repression on multiple fronts. Learn more in this special report, which examines the complex history of the Western Sahara and the current struggles of the Sahrawi people. Hi, I'm Phoenix Godwin, founder and journalist for World Revolution News. I'm going to take quite a leap from the developing WRN format because this report involves an especially complicated and historical situation which a lot of people aren't aware of. It is affected by a lot of imperialism and colonialism from various political powers over at least a thousand years, and as such, there are hundreds of years worth of concerted efforts from competing interests to manipulate, erase, and even fabricate information to the relevant history. So if we want to build a genuinely decolonial and hopefully somewhat accurate understanding of the situation, we have to start far, far back in history, to prehistory even. And when we do that, we see that this story in particular holds a lot of relevance to the history of the rest of the world as well, and perhaps even for our future. This is going to be a two-part report. Because to really appreciate the importance of this story, which has practically been buried and literally from the rest of the world, we have to first explore prehistory as well as the history of civilization itself, for reasons that will hopefully be clear in time. Sources are listed in the description. Join me as we dive deep into the past, as close as we can to the bottom of this situation. The setting for this is the Sahara Desert. Today we know it as the driest, hottest part of the planet, with strong equatorial winds which help keep the sky clear of rain-carrying clouds. It wasn't always like this though, and to understand how it got this way means understanding the orbit of the Earth itself. See, the equator, and no, not this one, that's just one of many made-up lines on the map. Also, the continents are the wrong size too, and in reality, Russia and North America uh, and India could all roughly fit on the African continent. Why did it get changed to be like that anyway? It's probably nothing. Anyway, the angle of Earth's rotation wobbles back and forth, moving the conditions of the equator up and down in cycles called axial processions, estimated to be about 26,000 years long. At least from what I can find, there are some varying estimations of this, but I don't claim to be an astronomer, actually. Uh, this is to talk about the history, and the point is that this goes about every tens of thousands of years. 
But for a long time, even in the hottest, driest times, the Sahara region was once full of life and wouldn't come to be the particular climate it is today until relatively recent in human history. Here's what the Sahara looked like millions of years ago. This is the Tethys Sea. Among other things, fossil and geological evidence indicates that Earth's vast oceans once covered much of the region. As time passed, the tectonic plate under Africa slowly moved north, the topography was pushed upwards, and the sea gradually became mostly cut off from the Atlantic Ocean about 3 million years ago. To put that in perspective, incidentally, this is roughly the age of the oldest stone tools we've dated so far, rediscovered in modern-day Kenya. But the Sahara still wouldn't become the vast desert it is today for millions of years. With flow from the Atlantic becoming mostly limited, the Tethys Sea gradually receded over a long, long time. It left behind a massive system of lakes and rivers which cut through the continent and filled into the porous rock beneath the surface, altogether maintaining a vast ecosystem of tropical forests, wetlands, beaches, and grasslands referred to as the Green Sahara. Over millennia, this shifted with varying glacial pressures and underground water cycles, affecting weather patterns and ecology which shifted across the meandering equator. As this went on, early species of hominins were undergoing a long and complex process of speciation and hybridization across the continent and beyond. The oldest evidence of stone tool usage in North Africa itself, most relevant to the region we're focusing on for the purposes of this report, dates to nearly two million years ago. At this time, we know there were some of these folks, and these, and these, and, and probably some of these as well, and probably more. And they would travel and forage and hunt, and at least some would make stone tools, and occasionally they'd get freaky together, and likely even collaborate. Evidence of sites for movable housing go back hundreds of thousands of years, indicating that people were moving for reasons likely involving other animal migrations and climate patterns. Not so separate of things, really, because animals move along with the climate. This is particularly important because much of Western academia limits pastoralism, the tending of other animals for human use, to the domestication of so-called livestock. Pastoralism is usually treated as an invention of future civilizations, but not only is there lots of evidence to suggest that many people had various and often quite close, even symbiotic relationships with herds of animals which helped shape all of anthropological life before, there are literally people alive today who still practice some ancient herding techniques on some level. Not that all people who aren't civilized were herding, as time passed, ancient prehistory across the world saw incalculable cultures. Sometimes they had settlements, sometimes they intentionally manipulated plant growth, some hunted, fished, made vessels for storage and cooking, and sometimes they even made something like cities. That one's a really long time ago and is not a civilization. In fact, there's no social hierarchy there. It's interesting and worth looking up. Anyway, for quite some time, lots of people lived lots of different lifestyles, which came from millions of years of evolution in a way all but completely removed from our own. Things we take for granted today, like poverty, subjugation, and even today's common concept of work, simply didn't exist yet, with few exceptions. So what exactly is civilization? Well, some historians today still characterize civilization as simply the use of cities, more or less the origin of the word. But even the meaning of the word city gets to be a bit contested among historians when we're talking about such ancient times. City and civilization have both come to be defined by some as an agricultural development, such as what historian Daniel Quinn refers to as totalitarian agriculture, which often involves clearing the biodiversity of a piece of settled land for farming use, sometimes for a single type of useful crop, resulting in a surplus food supply, something that's also considered critical by many to define these words. Something else civilization and even cities have come to be defined by is various levels of so-called social stratification. Whereas a lot of evidence suggests the majority of cultures in the world had been mostly egalitarian, regarding hierarchical living as undesirable, including between the sexes, which will be important later, some cultures created and maintained forms of specialized labor and even social hierarchy, but only through a complex interweaving of coinciding conditions involving geology, changing ecology, population migration, and unique social stratification, usually upheld through human slavery and particular religious traits like human sacrifice and early astrology, resulted in the so-called dawn of civilization. 
This period witnessed the independent formation of multiple unique cultures that managed to not only combine all of these various characteristics, agriculture, social hierarchy, cities, land conversion, but also generally sustained them for even thousands of years. It's also worth noting there were some false dawns where civilizations were built and subsequently collapsed and or were simply abandoned. The earliest clear records of the social and agricultural practices we associate with civilization started kicking off with the Neolithic or agricultural revolution roughly 12,000 years ago. This process was very gradual though, occurring in places we call the cradles of civilization. There, some peoples managed to create irrigated agriculture around predictable waterways, and this facilitated a unique form of society which had not been sustainable before. Now, the earliest evidence we found of people living in the West Sahara region itself are referred to as the Kifian culture, whose remains were found here at the Gobero site. They did some hunting and fishing and had tools and pottery roughly 9,000 years ago, and they spent about a thousand years here. We know this because they basically left a huge graveyard for us to find and analyze. The Kifians aren't considered a civilization by any means though and record of them in the area seems to stop as the next round of drier climate took hold of the region, likely causing the Kiffians to move on, perhaps quite literally, to greener pastures. Now, over the next few thousand years, some of these agricultural communities to the far east of the Gobero site would spread, building increasingly urban settlements which often maintained progressively controlling relationships with nearby communities and pastoralists. Over time, the people around them who didn't join willingly would eventually be forced through various means into an ideology of subjugation and cultural hegemony. Either pay tribute to the spreading culture of urbanizing agriculturalists, risk being literally enslaved, join or die, or flee with your families and animals to the hills or, you know, in the general direction of away. Through this, the agriculturalists started dynasties and many empires, conflicts with neighboring nomadic groups, all-out wars, and eventually little city-states, making the docile yet progressive-sounding so-called cradle of civilization seem more and more like a Rosemary's Baby type of situation than anything else. What have you done to him, you maniac? Satan is his father, not Guy. Now, According to just about any definition, Mesopotamia has firmly established civilization by the year 3000 BC. And they're not the only ones, and in fact by now they're even trading with another civilization and they're even writing records about it. And that brings us to a very important point. Have you ever been reading something and you think to yourself, wait, who the f actually wrote this? Well if so, congratulations, because you've at least dipped your toes into postmodernism. Now, we're not going to be going too deep into this philosophy, but the important thing for us now is that postmodernism is basically a lens which seeks to critically analyze not just content, but the creator and the social conditioning around them, and the intention, and the effects of different types of cultural production on people who observed it, especially, but not limited to, writing. And this might seem like an obvious and incredibly important element to understanding and researching history, because it totally is. But it actually took decades for this to become just a somewhat normal way of understanding history, as late as the 1980s. And what we've learned since then is that a lot of history and depictions of non-Western people written by others in the so-called Western world up to this point, especially about people who aren't civilized, well, it's not very accurate. In fact, often it's a horrible garbage fire of imposed ideologies at best, and outright racist lies at worst. That doesn't mean it's completely useless, though. Far from it. If anything, this lens helps us learn even more from recorded history than we were ever able to before. But postmodernism still isn't necessarily a very popular movement, even relative to the academic world. And why is that, you should ask? Well, I'm no expert. But I have grown up in a society which uses written words and art to try to tell me how and even why to live, to varying degrees of success, all my life. And I think it might just have something to do with the fact that questioning who makes these things and why takes away from the social control elements they were developed for from the beginning. Let's explore. Writing, as we think of it today, is often cited as being created by those civilized societies. But a better word might be developed, because evidence of symbols likely meant to invoke meaning have been found in many places from since long before civilizations were established. The earliest evidence that we've found so far are pretty simple and surprisingly easy to translate. Here's an example which dates back to over 30,000 years ago, which says, 
What do you think it says? It says 29. And if this one example is just coincidentally notched 29 times at random intervals at various cutting widths indicating different tools were used to mark it over time, there are plenty of other ancient so-called tally sticks which we found evidence of from ancient peoples around the world. Now you might say to me, hey, that doesn't count. Uh, well, it's not writing, it's just keeping count. You might even compare it to drawing. In which case, I'm happy to be the first one to show you this. This is basically an ancient Sumerian receipt from Mesopotamia. Now, loads of these are our earliest known examples of what we think of as writing today, and it was used to keep records for trade, to count. This written language developed over time to be written with the reed stylus, which would be pressed into clay tablets, which were later baked for preservation. That's pretty cool. Do you think I can learn to write like that? Um, nice try, but you may need to go to summer school. Since most people couldn't sign their names, they would use a personal marker seal that would leave an imprint in the soft clay. Every seal was different and would identify who signed the document. Meanwhile, back at the old goat barrel watering hole, the lake is once again a lake, and people have been burying bodies here again for roughly a millennium. This time it's a culture we call the Tenarians, and the remains they left behind indicate a more nomadic pastoral community who at least visited this area as a regular staycation spot for a few thousand years. Fishing, feeding and watering animals, using baskets and pottery and jewelry, huntering, gathering, and of course burying their dead. The Tenarians seemed by all accounts to consider the Gobero a pretty chill place to be, and they didn't seem to have experienced much traumatic violence as far as we can tell. But as far removed as they were from their distant proto-imperialist cousins in Mesopotamia, the Tenarian way of life, among other things, was going to be drastically affected by them in a relatively short amount of time. And I mean short. See, on top of shifts in the Earth's axis and lunar cycles on the groundwater and various densities of rock affecting the climate over time, what happens when you overgraze an exponentially overfarm land with rudimentary monoculture is it creates compounding effects including loss of land fertility and something called the albedo effect, which involves the relationship of the sun's energy on climate as it is absorbed by darker surfaces, like a forest canopy or ocean, or reflected by lighter surfaces, like a large ice sheet or sand. All of this resulted in an uneven but relatively rapid desertification, creating the Sahara we know today over the next few millennia, in some places transforming the once rich ecosystem into dry and almost completely barren wasteland in as fast as 200 years. As for the Tenarians themselves, well, the Gobero stopped being so chill, and the lake dried up again. By 2550 BC, they moved on, marking the end of consistent settled life we have record of in the Western Sahara for a long, long time. Meanwhile, in Mesopotamia, writing and pictography was being expanded by civilizations to reinforce the hierarchical nature of its society. First, through religion, which was used to make the word of kings and priests, etc., a matter of divinity and staving off Armageddon, rather than just some dude who was telling everyone, among other things, why they had to work really hard in a society where some people didn't have to work so hard. It really helped that these people had access to the astrologers, that they could get omens or symbols from the sky and be able to tell more or less when they were going to happen from very early math, which we also have evidence of and it's fascinating and for those people who are into astrology you should look into this because it gets a little bit dark. But we're not talking about that. The people of Sumer looked to their king as a god on earth. It would have been pretty fun to be a king in Sumer. It's important to note that only a very few select people in these societies, let alone the world, are writing at this point. It's estimated that for thousands of years, only 1% of a population would be taught literacy. Specifically, these would be people in powerful positions of leadership and or wealth. So not only do the first historic ruling class have exclusive access to the world's history, but they're literally writing it themselves. All of this really helps maintain the social hierarchies and violent expansions of civilizations, which otherwise might not have been so appealing if it weren't for the ever-looming threat of angering the gods, which apparently those couple guys in the palace could actually talk to. 
And you might have noticed I said dudes and guys because things were actually starting to get pretty bleak for non-dudes and guys in these societies. In fact, systemic patriarchal values are incorporated so early on that the first examples of Sumerian laws we have evidence of, aside from attempting to rein in abuses of wealthy aristocrats, involve the subjugation of women as well as slaves. And at first I was wondering, you know, why, right? Because while slaves were usually taken from other societies, and I could understand that some form of slavery had been critical in maintaining the disparaging nature of civilized society, the thing about going from an egalitarian to a misogynistic society is that it would alienate roughly half of your population. So I'm guessing this was something which took time and met with considerable resistance and difficulty. So why would it be worth the effort to the people who are controlling said society? And I'm sure it was a variety of reasons, none of them good, but the biggest thing that stands out to me is that if you're pioneering a societal structure with a labor-dependent food surplus in relation to the population, then you need to be able to control the numbers of the population. And that's exactly what they did. Laws banning the practices of women having more than one husband in Samaria were created around 2300 BC, and a disturbing tradition of subjugating women for the sake of civic engineering, which persists to this day, often still incorporating religion. Speaking of which, the first and earliest religions weren't monotheistic. They didn't believe in any one god. But a fairly major shift started in the 6th century BC, and the religions of empires became gradually monotheistic, contributing to larger empires of vast social and economic authority, so effective that some of them still persist in some forms today. All around the Sahara, civilization spread, conquering, trading, enslaving and fractionalizing, intertwining with themselves with the social structures and economic relationships of the people they encountered in ways which forced those they encountered to either participate, resist, which they often did, and that will become relevant later, or to try to live somewhere else, which was a bit more possible back then because civilization hadn't conquered the world yet. And there were still a number of alternative cultures, but that change is on its way, and supposedly ordained by the gods themselves, no less. It's possible, perhaps likely, that this was even the beginning of grouping various others together in convenient ways. Even today, the very word tribes itself is incorrectly used in common discourse to reduce, coalesce, and categorize all manner of non-civilized peoples, despite the massive variety of existing political structures which exist among them especially considering some of this writing of these others was outright disdainful from the very beginning, basically amounting to those uncultured people deserve to be extorted for tribute, conquered, their cultures exterminated, the land they lived on occupied and farmed, and the people, you know, enslaved. This politically motivated outlook towards indigenous people is still perpetuated in many instances today. Here's the reason why all of this has been relevant to the story of the Saharari in the Western Sahara. Just as Sahara is Arabic for desert, Saharari is Arabic for desert people, originally a catch-all term for the various nomadic peoples of the Sahara. And while nomadic life of humans in the desert didn't leave a lot of direct evidence for us to find, besides some actual people who are often marginalized into obscurity and unimportance, we gather a variety of historical sources indicating contact with them, trade, immigration, and conflict with a variety of peoples who managed to maintain mobile lifestyles even in the inhospitable climate of the desert. This whole story we've covered so far shows us that the origin of the nomadic people in the desert is something which likely evolved with the desert, rather than non-desert people deciding to migrate into the harsh climates of the desert. Unfortunately, a lot of our popular historical understanding of nomadic people in this region from this point on, for thousands of years, relies almost entirely on the written testimony of the civilizations who interacted with and or wrote about them. And a lot of times, this writing likely served as more of a convenient narrative to serve the interest of politics, commerce, and violent expansion, rather than an actual anthropologic record of social structures and lifestyles of non-civilized people. Now, this is a good part to take a break. And uh, next video, we're going to talk about how the Western Sahara region here was formed specifically through the vigorous resistance of our indigenous people to the civilized world that lasted all the way to the 20th century. Uh, if you want to see that one, which I really hope you do because I've been working very hard on this report, please subscribe, hit the bell notification icon. If you learned anything from this video, then please go ahead and share it with a friend so that they can learn something also. Hit the like button because it does help. 
And uh, finally, comment if there's something that you have a question about or that you don't see a source for or that seems incorrect based on what I have written in the Google Docs link that's in the description. And uh, also, I do everything myself with borrowed equipment and also uh, I made this by myself with paint that just happened to be lying around. I was really lucky it's the right color. And, um, you know, uh, if, if you want to help out, if you think that this good work I'm doing, I got a Patreon. Just one dollar or one euro could really help. But, you know, just just liking and subscribing and sharing also helps. Money helps especially because I'm eating a lot of food from the dumpster and like, well, that can be super awesome. Sometimes it would be nice to be able to afford to like go to the dentist and things like that. Anyway, I digress. This isn't about me. This is about other things that are actually more important than just me. So uh, I'm going to keep doing these reports either way. And I hope to see you next time.